the end of the 9th century, a new people, the Magyars, moved into the Carpathian Basin from the east. Medieval chronicles record the legend that they arrived from Scythia. The minstrels told how the mother of Armosh, their first ruler, saw a bird of prey in a dream and knew from this that her unborn child and its descendants were destined for greatness and would establish a great country. Moreover, the dynasty claimed descent from an ancient king called Menrod and his sons, Hunor and Margor, who looked for a new home. The Magyars really did arrive from the east, all the way from the steppes of grassland and forest to the east of the Urals. The first territory they occupied that can be identified from the sources was Etekuz, the steppe north of the Black Sea, where the ancestors of the Hungarians may have lived in the first half of the 9th century. In 895, they moved on from there to their final homelands, the Carpathian Basin, surrounded by mountains, but their links to the east remained for a long time. Rich in wetlands and pastures, and flowing with milk and honey, the region offered easier living conditions, and it soon turned out that the nomadic way of life was no longer necessary. The Magyars had settled down. The people newly arrived in Europe at the turn of the 10th century were known as feared warriors, whose military campaigns reached as far as the Atlantic Ocean, the Iberian Peninsula, and the heel of the boot of Italy. But what made this success possible? We will now go in search of the answer using the historical sources and with the help of reenactors who use the results of archaeology to recreate and try out ancient weapons. In the saddle, on horseback, the art of war of the conquest era Magyars. The Eurasian nomads, including the Magyars, were known as formidable horse archers. Their legendary weapon was the composite reflex bow with stiffened ends. This type of bow had been developed over the course of centuries specifically for mounted combat. A relatively small weapon was needed for this, and two techniques were employed to make it. The use of different types of material for the arms, and the use of stiff ends to aid in bending the arms. The bow was one of the most complex tools of the nomads, and it was one of the greatest achievements of their craftsmanship. Reflex bows were made from three materials, wood, horn, and sinew. The core of the bow was formed from wood, and it held together the other components. The horn went on the side of the wooden core, facing the archer and working like a spring. It bent when the bow was drawn and returned to its original state when the bow was released. The gluing of the horn was one of the most delicate phases in making a bow. The sinews were obtained from the rear legs of deers. After being dried and split into threads, they were made into carefully arranged sheets, which were then glued onto the outer side of the bow's arms. When the bow is drawn, the sinew stretches in a similar way to a rubber band, and it snaps back on release. The bow's horns and grip were stiffened with plates made from antlers. The finished bow was covered with bark or fish skin to protect it from moisture. The Magyars used hourglass shaped quivers which the entire length of the arrows fit into. The quivers were made from wood in two different ways. They were either carved from a log split in two or pieces of wood were glued together into the required shape. 
The mouth of the quiver was decorated with sheets of bone, and the whole quiver was covered in leather or bark before being reinforced with iron rods and strips, which was characteristic of the Magyars. The construction of the arrow, which seems simple at first glance, also required a lot of expertise. Instead of a plank, it was made from a twig. After the bark had been removed, this was smoothed down and then shaped. The arrowhead had a spike on the end, which was drilled into the rod. The feathers were attached with sinew. and then cut into shape before being strengthened using tendons. There were different shapes of arrowheads depending on what the arrow was used for. The bow cases were sewn from leather and slightly more than half of the bow fit inside. The case was usually attached with a single strap, which was designed with balance in mind. This type of case was unknown to the Avars, and its use was an important innovation as it allowed warriors to quickly and easily choose between short and long range weapons. The Magyar's archery equipment formed a complex system. The warriors wore the bow case on the left side as they held the bow in their left hand. They handled the arrows with the right hand, so they hung the quiver on the right side at an angle of 45 degrees to facilitate removing the arrows. For the same reason, they put the arrows in the quiver with the tips pointing upwards. This type of bow was usually drawn with a thumb, so horse archers used a special thumb ring for protection. The Magyars presumably did the same. Drawing with the thumb enabled archers to keep additional arrows in the right hand to shoot more quickly. The quiver held a total of 12 to 15 arrows, so warriors had to consider when to use them and against who. For close combat, the Magyars used lances, light axes, sabres and swords which they were able to produce themselves. Within the Carpathian Basin, a metal smelting technique similar to that of the Avars was used in the county of Shomosh and in the appropriately named County of Vosh, meaning iron. The iron smelters at the time of the occupation of the Carpathian Basin worked iron cores that could be obtained from surface mining. These ores were smelted in a furnace called a bloomery. First, the front opening of the furnace was closed up with clay. Then they heated it up with wood and afterwards charcoal. In order to increase the temperature, air was continuously blown into the furnace using hand-operated bellows. A large amount of slag was produced during smelting, which, when necessary, was removed by creating an opening beneath the pipe through which air enters the bloomery. Relatively pure iron was produced in the furnace from the iron ore. The small particles of iron combined to form a spongy mass called a bloom, which was removed from the bloomery at the end of the smelting and compacted on a tree stump. The bloom was repeatedly heated and compacted to remove as much slag as possible and consolidate it even more. The still glowing ball of iron was again and again wedged, that is, cut half or two thirds of the way through. The smith broke the compacted iron ball into two, 
The two halves were reheated many times in a smaller forge and then shaped into rods using an iron hammer and anvil. The forging of so-called wrought iron is more laborious than for modern day steel as wrought iron contains slag inclusions. Arrowheads, heads for light axes and lance heads were comparatively easy to make and so they could be produced in mobile forges. There were many different types of axe heads in terms of the size of the cutting edge, the curve of the head and the design of the butt. Lances were rarely placed in graves beside the body, so there were only a few examples from the archaeological remains of the Carpathian Basin, and some of these are the larger West and North European styles. However, the characteristically narrow lance with a four-sided tip was a basic weapon of the horse nomads, which they even used for sparring. Hungarian sabres were characteristic of the age, with similar weapons being used in the Khazar Khaganate, in the Caucasus and in Central Asia. The weapon was used for thrusting as well as slashing, which is shown by the curve of the hilt towards the edge. One edge of the slightly curved blade was sharpened along its entire length, and on the other edge there was a 15 to 20 centimetre counter edge. The cross guard was relatively small, and there were usually spherical balls at the two ends. In the Carpathian Basin, the Magyars acquired more and more straight double-edged western swords. And a special local version emerged called the Sabre-Hilted Sword. Like the elite warriors of the steppes, the Magyar nobles and professional soldiers wore relatively heavy protection, such as chainmail shirts and helmets, although little trace of this remains. The manufacture of this equipment required a high degree of specialist knowledge and workshop capacity, which was not necessarily available in the Carpathian Basin. The Magyars of the time, therefore, acquired them, at least in part, through trade or plunder or as gifts. The only conquest period helmet known to come from the Carpathian Basin was found in Pirch. Its shape and method of manufacture suggests Eastern European designs. It was riveted together from four pieces. A chain veil composed of small rings could be attached to it to protect the neck and shoulders. Similar helmets have been found in graves in Monvolovka 
associated with the Etekers Magyars. The majority of the military strength of the conquest period Magyars came from able-bodied men, primarily those engaged in animal husbandry. These men were not soldiers, but their way of life gave them skills which made them excellent warriors. Their main weapon was the bow, which they used every day for hunting or to protect livestock from predators. This weapon could cause serious wounds at a distance of 150 to 200 meters, but was also used for closer targets, for example, while attacking or pursuing. Mounted archers could easily shoot forward, behind, and to the left, but were less effective at shooting to the right. An important component of the fighting technique was the quiver for holding a drawn bow, which made a rapid change of weapon possible. A mounted archer could use it to become a hand-to-hand -hand fighter within seconds. The lance was probably the most common of these close quarter weapons. The retinue of the tribal chieftains and the ruler was made up of professional soldiers. Like other steppe peoples, the Magyars called them Bator, meaning brave, or Olop. These words appear in the settlement names Nirbator and Tisa Ulfhar. They were differentiated from the levies partly by the quality of their weapons, but above all by the quality of their armour. They wore helmets and chain mail shirts, and also used shields, and their horses were covered with some sort of armour. It is possible that they did not own the expensive weapons, so they did not end up in graves. They constituted a better trained, more experienced and more tight-knit fighting force than the levies. Contemporary sources stress that the Magyars fought in a more organized and disciplined way than other steppe people. The Magyar army was presumably organized into formations of tens, hundreds, thousands, and possibly tens of thousands, as is observed for other steppe peoples. There is no information on the total strength of the army, but only a fraction of the fighting force, a few hundred or possibly two to three thousand men, took part in individual campaigns. There were perhaps 5,000 men in the important large-scale Italian campaign of 899. A large quantity of food and supplies, including weapons, was needed for campaigns. The conquest era warriors took some of this with them and they procured the rest locally. The fighters were accompanied by many horses, both ridden and pack animals which carried preserved food, water skins and spare weapons, including many hundreds of arrows. The Magyars knew about medicine and the treatment of wounds. The traces of serious but healed combat injuries can be found on conquest-era skeletons. The Magyars became famous in the 9th to 10th century Europe for their military campaigns, though it is hotly debated what they intended to achieve with them. Three main reasons are typically given, however, they are not mutually exclusive. One approach emphasizes the plundering. The second opinion is that requests from foreign rulers form the background to the campaigns, 
while the third point of view is that the main driver was the overall economic and political objectives of the Magyar Tribal Confederation. By destroying their neighbors' territories, they could extract regular tribute and use them as staging areas for their longer campaigns. In the 9th century, internal divisions within the Frankish Empire became stronger. It split into several parts, and in time, the individual provinces turned against each other. During these civil wars, the opposing sides themselves often invited in the Magyars as auxiliary forces. The turbulent political conditions impeded organized and united action against the sudden attacks, so the burden of defense against the rapid attacks was borne almost exclusively by fortified locations and small groups that were permanently armed. However, if the Magyars, attacking with the benefits of surprise, managed to confine them to towns and castles, then entire regions could become undefended. The nomadic Magyar armies did not attempt to fight large battles at any cost, as they could achieve their aims without them. When necessary, however, they fought pitched battles using nomad tactics built on continuous and rapid movements. They preferred to fight in loose formations and tried to envelop or encircle the army, but when needed, they closed their ranks. They combined frontal attacks with feigned retreats, disintegrating the enemy formations. After encircling their pursuers, they deployed their reserves to ambush and break the enemy force with hails of arrows and finally a melee attack. They were capable of surprising their enemies by rapidly crossing large rivers. One of their greatest endeavors took place in 899, when about 5,000 horsemen unexpectedly flooded into northern Italy. The Italian king Berenga slowly gathered together a force, so the raiding Magyars had to retreat back to the east. The two armies clashed at the Brenta River. In a feigned show of weakness, the Magyars offered to give up their plunder in turn for safe passage. After a negative response, they suddenly crossed the river, attacked the much larger Italian army and carried out a terrible slaughter. After the victory, they did not return home but looted northern Italy for close to half a year and then signed a peace with Berenga, who paid tribute to the Magyars for more than two decades and, indeed, become a trusted ally. Contrary to popular belief, the European military endeavors of the Magyars were not only ended because their armies learned their tactics. A larger role was played by Saxon rulers, reuniting the former Eastern Frankish and Italian territories thus closing the routes for raiding in the west. And there were no longer any local powers turning to the Magyars for aid during wars against each other. Although the adventuring campaigns in the west had come to an end, in the meantime, the Magyars had become familiar with the political relations and organizational practices of Europe and they founded their own country based on the same model. Due to the strengthened relations with the West, the Magyar art of war also changed. Nevertheless, the emergence of modern Western battle tactics and weaponry did not lead to a complete transformation of the traditional weapons and tactics of the Magyar warriors. Though the long-distance nomadic animal husbandry quickly declined to be replaced by a settled way of life, the importance of the horse and of riding did not decrease. The poor nobles and levies continued to fight in the old traditional way, and it is not by chance that they were called quiver bearers for a long time. 
Like cavalry archers and their traditional tactics remained important in the Hungarian military culture for centuries, even though they now served the Christian kingdom of Hungary. <laughs>